Hello, everyone. Um, have folks been joining the call? Uh, can we get started? Yeah? Yep, we started. Uh, okay, people are joining. wonderful. Excellent. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining this fascinating conversation on a hot topic at the moment uh, related to the pandemic treaty, human rights and global health accountability. As, as you're aware, there's an ongoing debate and negotiations centered around the pandemic treaty, which is really meant to help us reflect on the mistakes of the past and anticipate future pandemics and global health emergencies. And I have an incredible panel um, I, I would say a new generation of activists and scholars, and, and I, when I say new generation, I don't, I'm not only referring to their youthful disposition, but I think a new way of thinking critically about human rights frameworks and, and global health architecture. And I'm really, really excited to be introducing uh, three panelists today. Unfortunately, our fourth panelist, um, uh, uh, Professor um, uh, Nina Schwab, had a medical emergency and was unable to join us. She's doing okay and we, we wish her a speedy recovery. Um, but she's certainly with us in, in spirit and, and helped to craft uh, some of the initial thinking and critiques around the accountability framework embedded in the um, draft pandemic treaty, which we'll also be talking through a little later today. But I'm, I'm very excited to be introducing, first and foremost, uh, Tamara Nelson, who's a research advisor at Amnesty International. Uh, Tamron um, is based at Amnesty, where she works on the global issues team um, at the intersection of COVID-19, the right to health, uh, and business and human rights. And prior to Amnesty, Tamron worked in various countries, in the Americas, Africa, while at Physicians for Human Rights, Planned Parenthood, Witness, the Pan-American Health Organization, and the Center for Justice and International Law. She holds an MPA from Harvard Kennedy School, um, far, far inferior to Columbia University, I should add, and a certificate in international human rights law from Oxford University um, and a BA from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. And then we have Timothy Fish Hodgson, legal advisor, economic and social rights um, at the International Commission of Jurists, a, a fellow South African who is responsible for designing and implementing the work of the ICJ around economic, social, and cultural rights um, in Africa and assists with ICJ's global work um, on ESC rights. Tim has worked in a range of countries, including South Africa, Swaziland, India, Myanmar, and Uzbekistan, and he's published various opinion pieces, book chapters, research reports, which I highly encourage you to read. He is not only an eloquent speaker, but a prolific writer. Um, whose ideas I think um, are, are incredibly important in, in shaping some of the conversations we're going to have today. And last but not least, uh, Leit Hanbali, uh, who is an analyst at Spark Street. Uh, he focuses on health policy, has worked as a public health practitioner, a doctor, um, and a real doctor, by the way, not like me with, with a PhD, a medical doctor, a researcher, uh, there's a there's a hierarchy, by the way, Leith here at, at Columbia about you know uh, who gets to be called doctor. So um, your, your experience is, is really important. Anyway, researcher and volunteered as a civil society organizer. He has a master's degree in health policy, planning and financing from the London School of Economics and Political Science and uh, the London School of Hygiene and, and Tropical uh, Medicine. I'm glad that you reject the hierarchy. We, we are here to decolonize the hierarchy. So let's see how this conversation goes. And of course, so he has a medical degree and a bachelor's degree in global health from the Univ uh, University College London. He is based in London um, and is bilingual in English and Arabic. And, and for those of you who don't know, my name is Kayum, um, far um, less qualified to be on this panel than any of the other panelists. I, I'm really here to facilitate a conversation with all of you. Um, on, as I said, a, a really important and ongoing critical conversation that's that's uh, making the rounds at the moment in, in various global health spaces. So I'm going to start off with a, with a series of questions, and then I'd like folks uh, on the call to begin to either in the in the chat uh, note some of the questions they want to pose, and, and then we'll have an opportunity to hear from you um, in a little bit. So the first question goes to to Tamarin. 
Um, Cameron, you know, there's been a lot written about the zero draft of the pandemic treaty. And in some of the articles I've I've looked at, um, it suggests that the, the, the treaty touches on some of the core issues of concern uh, related to research and development and vaccine procurement contracts, for instance. Um, and a number of civil society groups have, have welcomed the fact that the treaty touches on these, these core issues. But I've also seen critiques of the zero draft suggesting that there is a lack of accountability mechanisms in the draft text, for instance. There's also a, a failure to, to draw on uh, human rights language in the text that necessarily um, warrants what's reflected in inter international human rights law. So I'm, I'm curious how civil society groups, including Amnesty, are responding to the zero draft. Sure, thanks, Kay. Um, can everyone hear me? Is it good? Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, thanks so much for, for inviting us um, and for having Amnesty. Um, I'm happy to sort of walk through, I think, like you said, I think different civil society organizations have different positions on the zero draft and the pandemic treaty in general. Um, I, I can walk us through some of the positions um, that, that Amnesty has had. Um, I should say also, uh, this is an issue that we've been working on um, jointly also with uh, Human Rights Watch and ICJ um, and the Global Initiative for ESCR. So um, definitely a, a joint effort on a lot of these issues. Um, so I should start by saying that um, the, the zero draft, as it said, is, is a starting point. Um, so we have a long road ahead. Um, the goal is to have uh, an actual instrument by May 2024. Um, on the positive side, like you said, it does touch upon um, several issues that for us are very important. On the negative side, it's how those issues are framed. And the question is whether they're framed in a way that will actually change the game and actually make a difference if and when we do have another public emergency. So if we back up for a second, um, the pandemic treaty covers a lot of different issues. Um, but if we look at the, the pandemic that we're in now, the COVID-19 pandemic, one of the key issues um, for human rights groups has been the issues, the issue of medical countermeasures or key medical you know, health products um, that have not been accessible for everyone in, at, at different times. So for example, oxygen, um, PPE, vaccines, obviously is, is the largest one. And we could say that that's the one that probably had the largest global disparity in access. Um, and it has become more equitable over time, but there are ripple effects to that. And so for amnesty and other groups, this is the key issue that, that should never be repeated. Um, and if we look back in a nutshell, basically the problem was limited supply, especially in the beginning. Um, so at first we had a few countries, high income countries that were buying up all the supply before it even existed, before there were even approvals. Um, and then we had a few companies that actually, once those, those vaccines were approved, they were selling them mostly to high income countries and making decisions based on pricing, um, which meant that lower income countries were, were left behind in that. So the good news is the, the zero draft does talk about medical countermeasures. It does acknowledge the need for fair distribution across countries. Um, the not so great news is that it doesn't go as far as laying it out as actual human rights obligations to actually ensure that that happens. And, and we need to frame that differently if we actually want the treaty to be, to be a game changer. So for example, um, the, in this, in this particular draft, the, the pandemic treaty actually act, added a chapter on human rights. And of course it talks about the right to health. So that's positive. Um, but it doesn't actually go as far as talking about the right to scientific progress, um, which for us is important in terms of, of health products because like we saw in COVID, the creation of a COVID vaccine in less than a year was a huge development in scientific progress, um, went to market in less than a year, but it certainly wasn't accessible to everyone in a timely, timely fashion as it should have been. Um, so that's one, one glaring omission. And then the text actually talks about different, different issues. So for example, it talks about intellectual property rights, um, which is a barrier to increasing that supply. It talks about the need for knowledge and technology transfer to make sure that other manufacturers can actually be manufacturing at the same time and increasing that supply. It talks about um, conditionality around public funding. So the amount of money that public, that pharma companies had received from governments um, would, should, should condition them to, to certain, um, <clears throat> certain obligations around distribution. 
Um, but it doesn't, again, go as far as actually saying what needs to happen. So for example, it talks about the fact that states have the right to waive um, intellectual property rights during an emergency, but it doesn't actually say when states actually have the obligation to do that to be sure that they're following their human rights obligations. Um, and what we saw at the WTO, at the, the World Trade Organization, is that countries had the opportunity to do that and yet didn't do it. So laying that out in terms of actual obligations and when are situations where that actually has to be um, implemented would be key. Um, and the same goes for knowledge and technology transfer. So it touches upon it, um, but it uses language like strengthen, incentivize, encourage, support. It doesn't actually lay out the actual obligation. Um, and it talks about conditionality around public funding, but it, it comes with a vague caveat saying it's compulsory, but it's dependent. Um, I think the language is the extent to which public uh, funding is received. So a bit vague um, and, and a little bit more detail around that would actually um, give the, the pandemic treaty a bit more teeth in terms of that. Um, and then a few other issues around, around process. Um, one is there also are conversations around a new platform um, around how to distribute medical countermeasures. Um, I think there was a meeting last week in South Africa about that. Um, and this is based on an evaluation of, of the ACT A and, and the COVAX facility and how that did um, during this pandemic. And it's great that that's being discussed, but it's not entirely clear how it'll dovetail with the pandemic treaty and they go hand in hand. Um, and the timing of those two seem to be a bit different. Um, the second, which is probably one of the biggest things, is the lack of accountability measures, as you mentioned. Um, they mentioned some sort of mechanism, but it's not clear. It says that um, the accord would only decide on the details about uh, around that um, later, which it, it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem there. Um, for the treaty to actually make a difference, it needs to have some sort of accountability mechanism linked to it. Um, and then the the third piece is um, the lack of of civil society engagement. So. Um, compared to other processes, this process seems to be a lot less transparent. Um, there's very little space for civil society to be participating. Um, I believe from discussions that were happening last week um, that the drafting groups um, that are, are going to be formed are not open to, to non-state actors. Um, so civil society wouldn't be able to have a, a role in that. Um, so there are issues around both the, the content and the process. Um, but basically, I'll, I'll stop there. But basically, those are, in a nutshell, some of the concerns that we have from a, from a human rights perspective. But Tamara, you, you've taken a, a very complex text and managed to succinctly capture, I think, some of the core challenges and concerns with that. So, so incredible work. Thank you very much. Um, and so wanting to pick up on the questions of, of process and, and substance, and particularly drill a little deeper into the question of accountability that you raised. Uh, Laith, uh, I want to turn some attention to you. I, I saw your piece in, in The Lancet, um, an article that you were first author on, uh, where you call for, um, and I quote, the establishment of an independent monitoring committee to, to monitor state parties' compliance uh, with reporting of the pandemic accord. Um, and, I, and I recognize, you know, in the same way that Tamron has, has indicated, the importance of building in an accountability mechanism uh, in any sort of future pandemic treaty. But my question is, how realistic um, is this recommendation? And, and I, I ask this question particularly because of the debates currently taking place uh, in, in the US Congress by, by Senate Republicans who have issued a number of statements, including draft legislation, uh, questioning the authority of the WHO and this process itself. And so curious whether a, a, a country like the US, who of course you know, plays a really important role in the global health architecture, would be willing to abide by an accountability mechanism that you that you are recommending. So any thoughts or reflections on that, Leif? Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, I have to say, Tamron, uh, you covered uh, just, yeah, a whole host of really complex things um, really comprehensively. So it's a really nice platform to, to build on uh, for the rest of the conversation. Uh, the really key thing to, to think about here, and I, I think this, this really links to um, exactly what, what, what Cameron has already touched on is, uh, you know, this, this is a treaty that's kind of being negotiated by member states. Um, uh, an important thing to really emphasize here is that member states have already agreed that they want something to be legally binding. Uh, 
and um, they've done that with the mandate that you know that, that they as a government have. Like no one, no one has forced them into that position, and so um, they have taken that position based on you know perceptions of risk, uh, perceptions of uh, interpretation of the evidence, and based on like political considerations, right? Like it's it's a combination of all of these um, various things, and uh, and it, and in, you know there is somewhere to you know we, we all have a position on the kind of cynicism to optimism scale um and also kind of how much we trust uh what governments say but you know even if we if we take that kind of like most cynical view that governments um were pushed because of the political pressure into agreeing um that that they will make uh, commitments, like firm legal commitments that they want to do certain things in order to prevent the next pandemic, in order to prepare for the next pandemic, in order to respond effectively to the next pandemic and recover well from the next pandemic, um, then like there's, there's clearly like a pathway uh, to that being, being a reality that governments agree to. And what accountability mechanisms that, that lots of different groups are suggesting and that we are, that we also found are important for a treaty like this um, are, are just a reflection of the obligations that member states would themselves agree that they want to fulfill. Um, so, so that's the that's like that's the, the kind of the argument um, around it. And just to emphasize why that's important based on the evidence that we reviewed, um, the reason that that, that is emphasized, the, the reason that accountability mechanisms, enforcement mechanisms, compliance mechanisms, lots of different uh, names for kind of essentially something that tries to do the same thing, um, is that uh, you know lots of different studies, uh, lots of different um, you know people ag um, agree that the um, that the essentially the only uh, the only modifiable treaty design feature, aka the only thing that can be written into the text. That increases the chance of a treaty actually having the intended effect that it's negotiated on the basis of is having these compliance mechanisms in place. So, of course, there are lots of other different things which are to do with the politics and which are to do with, um, you know, whatever contextual factors go on at the, at the time. But if we're talking about the text itself, the 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 thing, the most important thing to ensure that whatever obligations countries agree to have the highest chance of being of, turned into reality is having those accountability mechanisms there, and and that's that's essentially what the basis of uh, that's the kind of you know that's, that's the platform on which we build um, the next step of that compliance mechanism from from uh, Spark Street uh, report, which I think has been uh, posted into the chat. If anyone wants, wants to kind of read the detail of the evidence that we analysed to get to where we got to. The final bit I'll say is, is, is finally getting to the question that you asked, Kim, uh, it's going to uh, take a while to get there, uh, is about this independent monitoring mechanism. And essentially what, what, what that says, the reason that's important is um, there needs to be reliable evidence on which to say this country is um, you know, dealing with all of its obligations really well. Congratulations. Great. Everyone look at how great this example is and learn from it. Or um, actually, you know, this country is not doing, is not fulfilling its obligation, um, you know, does it need support, does it need a slap on the wrist, does it need some uh, kind of political pressure in order to fulfill its obligation? We can't, you know, what, what we've seen over and over again, and we've seen that in WHO as well as in other uh, processes, so within the international health regulations, for example, one of the big issues was that um, countries weren't always actually reporting what was happening on the ground. Um, they weren't reporting on their capacities fully accurately they you know countries want to look good they don't want to be called out because of the political implications of that so we can't leave something so important just to the those political sensitivities there needs to be a robust evidence base on which we um on on which we build um the, uh, our knowledge of whether countries are fulfilling their obligations or not fulfilling their obligations um so that's that's really important and what we found analyzing lots of different uh, mechanisms and treaties is that independent monitoring um you know having having people who are removed from from or as removed as possible from the various power dynamics and commercial interests and political interests um is is really important would would be really important to kind of ensure that the evidence that we're receiving and basing our assessments on 
is as robust as possible. So um, finally, uh, I outlined at the beginning of, of my answer why I think, why we thought that this was something that's realistic because it, you know, um, it, is, it is something that would be aligned with, with what governments themselves would agree to be held to, right? That, that, that they would be agreeing to these, to these legal obligations. But also, this is very, very, very important. This is too important not to try, even if it's something that's really, really ambitious as well. Thank you, Leith. And, and I recognize these, these issues are complex and probably also, you know, dependent on, on specific geographies and, and how we craft these ideas. But I appreciate the the argument you've made with respect to the, the Independent Monitoring Committee. Um, and, and of course, you, you recognize that countries don't want to be called out, but th there have been instances throughout this pandemic where countries have in some ways accepted being called out on, on a number of issues, including particularly with respect to its support for intellectual, intellectual property rights. And, and so I want to turn to, to Tim to 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 talk about one of my my favorite subjects um around ip and and tim the the icj together with amnesty human rights watch and, and others released a, a public statement just over a week ago in which it criticizes the zero draft for emphasizing um state's ability to limit intellectual property rights instead of identifying the instances where governments have an obligation to remove barriers of access under international law. And, and you know, this, this intellectual property debate, which has raged throughout the pandemic, seems to again be playing itself out uh, in the pandemic treaty discussions. I, I'm curious what lessons civil society um, have learned from the debates on IP during the, the height of the COVID-19 pandemic and, and how you think these lessons can be applied as we develop the, the pandemic treaty. Um, uh, good morning, I think, where you guys are. Uh, I'm here, I look like I'm in a cave because it's the evening here in Johannesburg, South Africa. And fortunately, I've managed to find a place that has electricity right now, um, which is not uh, very usual in Johannesburg in 2023. I'm also speaking to you about an hour before the president of South Africa uh, does what we call a cabinet reshuffle, meaning he's going to change the entire executive. So uh, however good this conversation might be, there's more excitement ahead of me tonight. Um, and I can't resist saying that uh, to add to the answer that Leith gave, um, to KM's question about uh, the stance of American politicians is that there would be nothing unusual about the American government not signing or supporting a treaty. Um, that's commonplace. Um, and we should try, if it actually highlights the importance of what uh, KM is saying, is that if we really want to get a treaty which is implemented and there is um, support of, we really need to try and get the American population to get the government to, to agree to something substantial. Um, because no country that has significant power in the world um, can really be, this is one of the lessons of the pandemic, outside of the responses to the pandemic. And the US is particularly important because of the question that came asked me, which is about intellectual property rights and the great number of pharmaceutical companies um, that are residing for in one way or another um, in, in the United States. But to, to answer your question, I mean, I think that there's there's, there's a way of dealing with it very complicatedly and a way of dealing with it very simply. And, and unfortunately, and I'm sorry, I'll do the simple way first. And, and, and I don't mean to condescend to anyone here because this really is um, you know, human rights 101 and international law 101. But uh, the, the, throughout the process that the WHO has ran for the development of this treaty and throughout the pandemic, state representatives on the WCO and uh, on WIPO and all of these different UN mechanisms have completely and fundamentally misunderstood human rights. And that's the point that Tamron uh, honed in on, which is to say that they take language from the TRIPS agreement, uh, not interpreting it consistently with any other international agreement, which is completely against international law and say, well, we're going to restate the fact that states have a right to waive intellectual property rights. But the, the language in that agreement is not very uh, good because the use of the word right suggests that you're talking about something that's a human right, but you're talking about a states, you know, states are, of course, entitled to do many things, but states are also obliged to do some things. And that is really what human rights lawyers want to advocate for in the pandemic treaties. What are states obliged to do? 
And when it comes to intellectual property rights, as Tamron has already highlighted, there is a right to scientific progress and there is a right to health. These rights and other associated rights are agreed to in many, many international treaties of almost every member of the WHO. Um, and they set out these obligations. There is no human right to intellectual property. There is uh, an interest in intellectual property. So what you're doing is you are contrasting obligations in terms of human rights that states have, and then interests which they have a valid reason to protect within the bounds of human rights. So the question really should be fundamentally answered from that perspective, which is that you should start off at the basis where if you have sections, and, and if you look at the zero draft of the treaty on intellectual property rights, the section should be subject to human rights standards, which they clearly are not. The general approach of the pandemic treaty when it comes to information sharing, technology sharing, resource sharing, is to use, and I'm going to just uh, read out the words now, and for lawyers or anyone who's watched any TV program about lawyers, uh, you see words like facilitate, incentivize, strengthen, encourage, and collaborate. Now, these are not these are words which 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 can be in in poems or political speeches then they're, they're not words that go in legal treaties it's very poor legal drafting because they are meaningless but that is actually the intention right the intention of those drafting at this stage is to try and put things in that people won't get scared of or disagree with but what it means is the effect of it is is that all of the sections try and appeal to the good sense of pharmaceutical companies and the good sense of states to collaborate with each other. It's just not the way that international law works. So international law obliges states to do things. And as a result, what you have here is a pandemic treaty that's inconsistent with the vast majority of, of, of international law, including international human rights law, um, made worse by the experience. So you want to, to know about the experience that we've had in COVID, the experience is the same experience that is had with pharmaceutical companies and private healthcare providers the world over, um, especially the multinational ones, is that you can get uh, private entities to collaborate on mechanisms if they have a say in the direction of the mechanism, but you will not get those private entities to forego completely their profit incentives. And the, the fundamental idea that the pandemic treaty needs to be dealing with is the fact that in a context of a pandemic, we can't be concerned about the profit motives of pharmaceutical companies over the over over human life. Now, having said all of that, which sounds pretty negative, um, I, I will say as a positive thing, it is the advocacy, undoubtedly, the advocacy of civil society organizations around the world for equitable vaccine access. That means that it was impossible to imagine, even for states that heavily oppose the inclusion of equitable resource sharing in the treaty, the inclusion of this in the treaty. It's on the table. It's also to the credit of civil society um, and uh, alliance, which I've been somewhat involved in, the Civil Society Alliance on Human Rights and the Pandemic Treaty, and many other organizations working around the WHO, that there is a specific article in this treaty on human rights. Um, it's interesting also from the perspective of, of intellectual property rights. I didn't pick this up the first time I read it, um, but I'll just point it out because it's interesting for our discussion that the article on human rights itself doesn't actually really refer to intellectual property and skirts around the issue of access to medicine. So it requires state parties um, to ensure non-discriminatory access to healthcare. Um, in the in their countries, but vaguely it says that, and it particularly people in vulnerable situations. And then it says people living under any restrictions of freedom of movement, such as quarantines or isolation, should have access to medicines or healthcare. But there's no there's no statement even in that Article 14 which gets to the issue of equitable sharing of resources. And we're not just talking about vaccines now; we could be talking about anything, face masks, um, hand sanitizer, anything to do with resources that you need to deal with, and anything in another pandemic. So you, you see something which is very interesting from a sort of political science perspective, which is how a treaty is drafted. And much of the debates about civil, in civil society now are how, to, how and to what extent to engage with drafts of a treaty that you know are political negotiations and political compromises. The last thing that I want to point out, which is significant, which is in the treaty, and it relates to the question that KMU asked late before, is that the phrase common but differentiated responsibilities, it appears there. Now, even amongst human rights, um, lawyers, uh, this phrase uh, elicits different responses. 
So it generally is intended to refer to the fact that states that have more should, should contribute more. So commensurately with what they can to global problems. Um, and it's a phrase that comes and has legal meaning in with the growing and emerging, emerging international environmental law, but it's not currently under international human rights law, which uses a softer phrase, which is international cooperation and assistance. Now, it's very good that this phrase finds its way into the draft. Um, states in developed countries are, 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 are very much, or the global north, I should say, are very much opposing uh, the inclusion of this phrase. And it will be interesting to watch what happens with this and the extent to which it either gets stronger or weaker and if the language changes uh, in that respect. But what we've learned for sure from the COVID-19 pandemic is that we're going to have to fight tooth and nail for the inclusion of anything that is substantial. And then as Leith and Tamron have emphasized also uh, on any accountability mechanisms to ensure that those substantial provisions are actually enforceable and enforced. Excellent, Tim. Thank you very much. I, I know you discounted uh, poetry and political statements, but you know I'm, I'm a strong advocate of incorporating some of that language at least um, into these documents, which which otherwise uh, I agree with you need to have much stronger emphasis on on the human rights law and language that we that you're referring to. Now, now listening to all three of you, I I get the sense that you are all in some ways critical of the the draft of the zero draft pandemic treaty but at the same time i i also get the sense that you are all invested in the idea of ensuring the pandemic treaty is able to deliver um on some of the promises that are alluded to in the text but not necessarily uh, reflected in the way you would like to see, whether it's on accountability mechanisms or human rights language or intellectual property. Uh, and so I'm now going to ask, you know, a slightly difficult question, which is, will the pandemic treaty actually make a difference? Uh, because if we if we are honest with ourselves, we have, as Tim and others have mentioned, existing international human rights law that protects the right to health and, and, for instance, reflected in Article 12 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. We have the World Health Organization Constitution that, that centers um, the idea of the right to health. And yet, those international instruments which existed prior to the COVID-19 pandemic have been unable to ensure you know, equitable vaccine access, for instance, during the ongoing COVID pandemic. And, and I recall, and this is a bit of a, a personal anecdote, I recall at the height of the pandemic, how I, as a South African living in New York, already had two shots of the vaccine and was in fact making an appointment for my booster shot when two of my uncles living in Cape Town in South Africa, died in the same week without having received a single shot of the vaccine, simply because they were living in South Africa rather than in New York. And this all took place um, with existing international human rights law um, and you know the, the kind of advocacy that organizations have been doing. And so my question is, will the pan if the pandemic treaty had been around prior to the current pandemic, would people like my uncles living in Cape Town have been alive today? Um, and, and I recognize it's a, it's a I, I'm posing this in a, in a rather a difficult manner, but I, it's really about, as many of you have said, you know, moving away from this profit-centered approach to thinking about health, to, to emphasizing a, a people-centered approach and saving lives. And I'm curious whether you, you actually believe that the pandemic treaty is going to make a difference. So let me reverse the order a little, start with Leith, then move to Tim and Tamarin. So, so Leith, your, your thoughts. Thank you. I think I mean, it, is, it, is a, it is a difficult question, but I, but I think maybe for a different reason, um, in addition to the ones that, that you mentioned, uh, I think it's important to, um, to point out that it's impossible to imagine or kind of predict what would have happened if we don't have the existing framework that, that are currently there, right? Um, things could have been a lot worse. Um, there are also lots of things, obviously, um, sorry, we're here, that could be better in the response. And 
I think it, at this point, uh, probably too soon to say, I think it's too soon to predict whether this pandemic treaty will or will not uh, make the kind of difference um, that we need to see in order to uh, try to, you know, to more effectively prevent the next pandemic, uh, prepare more effectively, respond more effectively, recover more effectively, um, and more equitably, obviously, effectively, for me, include, um, you know, uh, by necessity, equitably. Um, which is why I think that there's a responsibility to do everything that, that, that we can, uh, whether that's by producing the evidence, um, by kind of making conclusions of what policies need to be included, or by pushing for those policies um, through advocacy, lobbying, activism, whatever kind of different ways people um, exercise those, those things um, to, to try to make sure that, that uh, you know, we, we do everything that we can to maximize the chances of that, um, of that pandemic treaty, um, having those impacts that, that we want to see, recognizing um, you know, both, both the kind of opportunities and threats. And uh, you know, the opportunities are the huge political will that, um, that exists, the huge amount of attention that pandemic uh, and um, threat um, oh, oh Leith, we, we, sorry, we're one, losing you one, for. Um, uh, you know, we, we we lost you for a moment. Um, I, I, okay, it looks like you're back now. Apologies, please, please continue. No problem. Um, did, uh, so, you know, the opportunities that, that are here are a important bit, and um, they are the you know huge political will uh, I'm so sorry, Leith. Um, maybe maybe we'll we'll come back um, to your apologies for for cutting you off. It's really hard to. Um, ah. uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, sorry, Leith seems to have have frozen. Um, Tim, I know you don't have electricity in, in South Africa, but. Uh, Later is in the UK, and they clearly have some major Wi-Fi issues there. Later, we, we'll come back to you, Tim. Um, you know, building on what Late said, which I think is critically important, that 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 in some ways we have an obligation to ensure the realization of the treaty, because if we don't, you know, what what could happen um, is far worse than than what unfolded. Um, so, recognizing this argument, I'm I'm curious what what you think, Tim. Yeah, first of all, thanks for the really simple question uh, and the very long time frame in which to answer it. Um, I, I, I think that this question is, is fundamental and it's also an important thing that we should reflect on about international law generally and lawmaking in our own countries in particular. So the question really, as I understand it, and you can tell me if I'm wrong afterwards, is, is you know, to what, to what extent is the energy that's absorbed in developing new and increased amounts of these agreements uh, going to really actually make a practical effect in the world that we want to seek to achieve. Now, I think that the, 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 the overwhelming majority of people who are most affected by the terrible situations that occur in the world um, because of poverty and inequality, because of discrimination, would say that they, the, the overwhelming, not all, but the overwhelming majority would say that they, that they want the protection of the law and they want the acknowledgement of the law. And so on a fundamental level, I think that, that that's part of what we do when we're doing lawmaking domestically on internationally. The second aspect to think about is irrespective of what a treaty says, the one thing that a treaty in the WHO will do is move resources quite substantially. Um, and then the question is whether or not on things like research, on information sharing and all of this, that makes a difference overall to the equitable access to you know, healthcare resources. And the third part of it is whether or not the, the politics, like, so the political fact of states agreeing to something changes people's own um, perceptions somewhere about it. So if, if I'm inclined to say that if people don't know about the treaty, if the treaty doesn't take up global imagination, and then it isn't something that people hold against their governments globally, regionally, and nationally, then maybe it won't really make as much of a difference as what we want. And if people do take that interest and, and do then at the start of a, of, of, of a pandemic uh, 
or anywhere near a pandemic say, well, actually you've agreed to doing some stuff that has to do with equity and you've agreed to protecting human rights. So we don't want the same situation. Well, then it can be uh, more successful. I mean, on, the, on, a, on a more philosophical level, I think that, that for, for those who, of us who are trying to reinvent and reimagine global health, human rights, um, and society in the face of terrifying poverty and inequality and climate crisis, which is, it's, you know, it's not even about to hit us, it's hit us and we're already drowning in it. Um, we should think about the, the limited time that we have and the amount of energy that we want to put into these things. For organizations like Amnesty International, although I don't speak for them, ICJ, Human Rights Watch, again, don't speak for them. I think that we're always going to think that it's worth the while to do this for the reason that most organizations on a domestic level and most people who are fighting against human rights uh, violations really don't have the resources and time to spend on these things. Um, they have, they are significantly affected by them, but they don't necessarily have the resources and time to spend on them. So if you're asking me as a, as a, as a member of the ICJ, I think it's, it's a very effective use of the ICJ's time to make sure that we fight tooth and nail to ensure that the pandemic treaty is either good or that it's on record that we've warned the governments of the world that it really should be consistent with human rights or there will be a crisis. Uh, but depending on who you are, whether you're a doctor or a nurse or you're a unionist or uh, a random person in the world, that's another question, how much time you should spend it. I see uh, that uh, Russell Brand in particular and several uh, other very well-known individuals care a lot about the pandemic treaty because they seem to think it's part of some kind of like a conspiracy uh, of the Illuminati or something like that. You'll see a lot of this on Twitter. Um, I think that that's interesting too, because normally people, that is a way of kind of paying attention to what's going on in lawmaking, which is unusual. Um, but I'm not sure, like I, I can't give you a definitive answer uh, to the question. I, I hear you. Thank, thanks, nevertheless, for, for offering those really critical thoughts and reflections. Uh, and before turning to Tamara, I just want to invite the audience to begin submitting questions. There's already a star-studded lineup of questions from Professor Benjamin Mason Meyer, Rachel Moreski, uh, Joanne Chetta, that I'll get to immediately after Tamara uh, responds. So, Tamara, please go ahead. Sure. Um... Yeah, again, tough question. Um, and I can totally relate to your situation. So I, I was in the US during the beginning of the pandemic. My mom was in Brazil, um, took months to get her um, with, uh, I think it was Sinovac in the end, um, and then fully vaccinated her. And then I brought her to the US and they insisted on vaccinating her all over again. So go figure. Um, so yeah, I think the, the for me, the, the key issue is, um, with or without a pandemic treaty, what we need is actually state intervention um, because I just don't think pharmaceutical companies are gonna change on their own. I think the system is set up as it is and that needs to change. Um, so if we look back at the HIV crisis, um, you know, at the end of the day, it was government intervention that made generics um, come about. And I think there's a, there's a lesson to be learned there. So I think the pandemic treaty serves as one avenue to engage in that. Um, it's not gonna be a silver bullet, the treaties never are, um, but I, I do think it's a it's a starting point. And if if after a pandemic like COVID nineteen we can't sit down and have a conversation about how the rules are set up, um, then when would we ever have that conversation? So um, I'm positive about it being a starting point. Um, I, I don't want to you know get carried away that it's going to be a silver bullet and and change everything. But I do I do think it's it's a place to start having a conversation. And and for me personally, just even you know acknowledging just acknowledge that intellectual property rights are a problem. Um, you know, that would be a starting point to have a conversation about, at least in situations of a public health emergency, what are what are different sort of modes of operation that we're gonna have to be able to, to save lives and, and have something slightly more equitable. It's never gonna be perfect, um, but something more equitable. Um, and I do think a, a treaty is helpful in the long run in the sense that I think sometimes now we're, you know, we're almost entering our fourth year of the pandemic, it's hard to, remember back in the beginning where everything was a bit of a panic and everything, you know, time was running short and we don't know. And um, I think having that as sort of a touchstone, if, if we do happen to go through a similar pandemic, having that as a touchstone to remember, you know, there are some, some things here that, that we have learned and there are, there's um, certain obligations that we've laid out. Um, I know the international health regulations were there, but I do think a, a treaty would be 
slightly stronger um, in that sense. So overall positive, but not a silver bullet, of course. Thanks, Samran, and thanks for that um, honest reflection. And also, you know, talking about your the situation with your with your own mother, I recognize that all of us have had some sort of personal um, interactions with uh, with the way in which the pandemic has unfolded. So, so appreciate you sharing that. I'm now going to turn uh, to the questions in the chat, and I'm I'm going to use my uh, prerogative as chair to allocate some of these questions to to some of you uh, on the panel, so that we get to all of them. And I'm going to start with uh, Ben um, Myers, uh, Professor Ben Myers' um, question, which I I will direct to you, Tamron. Um, and, and Ben asks, in supporting civil society, it would be helpful to learn more about how civil society could leverage the UN human rights system, um, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Treaty Body Special Procedures, for instance, to support efforts to mainstream human rights across pandemic treaty obligations and facilitate human rights accountability for pandemic prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery. So, so this question is, is for Tamron in, in, in supporting civil society and how civil society could leverage UN human rights systems. And then Professor Rachel Moreski, my, my colleague um, at uh, Columbia University, um, and this question I'll, I'll direct to you, Tim. Um, she's interested in, in whether instead of the pandemic treaty, um, international human rights law needs to be strengthened. And perhaps she says we need a treaty, but countries that oppose the TRIPS waiver need to demonstrate that they are willing to put public health before corporate interests. And so if you could talk a little bit um, uh, about that um, and how uh, you know she's critiquing how WTO ministers should no longer use COVID-19 transmission as an excuse to lay decisions. Why not focus, she says, on strengthening existing international human rights law and focus more uh, on the trips waiver. So that's for you, Tim. And then uh, Professor Joanne Cheda's question, I'm going to direct to Leith. Um, uh, Joanne asks, with respect to an independent monitoring body, is there a real life model uh, that one might have in mind that has succeeded in motivating countries' compliance to a, to uh, demanding international to a demanding international agreement. So so let's start with Tamron, then move to Tim, and then Leith. And I'm going to save Sonia's question for for everyone right at the end. So so go ahead, Tamron. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the 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 important thing for civil society is to continue to engage. Um, you know, there there's limited space there, but I think the more uh, human rights organizations, public health organizations, um, civil society as a whole, the more you engage and take up that space, the more the more we'll be able to have some some sort of impact on that, some sort of influence. Um, I think, you know, Tim has, has sort of alluded to that as, as global human rights organizations. I think, um, you know, having more space uh, to hear from from other organizations around the world, I think, I think would be great. I think the more engagement there is, um, the better. Um, and, and I also think, you know, there's there's something to be said about, um, I, I think it was, Leith was talking about monitoring mechanisms and I think the extent to which human, uh, civil society can also be engaged in that, you know, you can't, you can't change what you can't measure. Um, and so therefore monitoring that and making sure that there's civil society participation there as well, um, I think would be, would be important and just continue, you know, pressuring that and, and keeping those, um, those channels open. So for example, with the WTO in discussion where it is now, you know, I think at this point, who knows what a, what a waiver would actually do in practical terms, but I think the extent to which this report coming out of the U.S. government could acknowledge intellectual property rights as an issue that has to be dealt with could also be you know, a step forward. So. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tamarin. Uh, Tim, to answer Rachel's question. Okay, first of all, um, I think I can give the same answer anyway, but I'm not sure whether or not Rachel is referring to the international health regulations or international uh, human rights law as IHR. But it doesn't matter because the answer is quite similar and also very irritating, my answer in advance, I'll tell you, which is that basically, I think that one of the things that I've learned personally as an international human rights lawyer is that the, the, our, our focus in international law is often very siloed and sees international regimes as separate and distinct with particular experts. And the pandemic shows how terribly terrible that is both from us as experts on the outside, but then also as governments. So I've had literal conversations with the WHO rep, the WTO rep, and the UN rep of a particular country separately who all say different things, for example, about the TRIPS waiver. 
And so then you have this problem. Um, and, and, and what we have been arguing for, but partially as a collaboration between global health academics and human rights um, organizations from quite early in the pandemic is a harmonization of global health law, international human rights law, and all other international law that is relevant to uh, public health emergencies and pandemics. So when it comes to IP, that means there's several regimes that we really have to look at changing. It might be harder to change, for example, TRIPS. It might be harder to change WIPO. Um, human rights law, I think, is, is not perfect, but it's in the best place when it comes to uh, intellectual property rights. And WHO law, both the international health regulations and the pandemic treaty both need to be much better on human rights. Um, there's an ongoing review process and there's a committee that is reviewing the IHR regulations. There's some, there's some very good people who are involved in that and trying with uh, some frustration to uh, make sure that they become meaningful changes because the IHR, even after they were revised in 2005, were very much, even if you just read them, um, without like an eye towards like, you know, legal technicalities, they're very fo much focused on, on maintaining cross-border trade. Um, and, and not some of the meatier issues uh, about human rights and health equity that we've seen. So there's no one really in the WHO that thinks that those need to be reformed. But there's no use in reforming one body of law unless you agree that what we need to do is understand it in line with all of the other. States have very many things to think about, um, and they must think about them together and consistently, and we should force them to think about them together and consistently. Thank you, Tim. And I, I finally, I looked at um, Rachel's link to the piece that you were referring to, and, to, and it was international health regulations. But thanks for that, that response, which I think yeah cuts across both the uh, regulations and international human rights law. Um, Laith, uh, question from from Joanne Cheddar about some real life models that one might have in mind. Any any thoughts on that? Mm. There are definitely lots of lots of lessons to learn from from other treaties, and that's exactly what we try to do. So, actually, the the proposal that, that we came up with in the report um, on independent monitoring for the proposed pandemic treaty does draw upon uh, lots of different examples. So, so we already kind of as part of that reviewed um, you know, human rights um, um, treaties and and the various kind of monitoring bodies for that. Uh, the International um, Atomic Energy Agency, uh, Chemicals Weapons Convention, etc. Um, you know, there isn't, there will never be a system that, that is perfect, obviously, and, and each kind of sector, each uh, regime of international law will have its kind of context. And, and so um, something will have to be kind of tailor-made for this, but, but we do draw upon um, a few of these kind of different examples. And, and for example, you know, uh, turning to some of what Tamron said during her answer about civil society being part of that independent monitoring, you know, that exists to, to a really high degree, for example, in human rights. Uh, so there are lots of kind of shadow reporting mechanisms that, that civil society take up on themselves because they care about human rights. And, and that kind of feeds into the reports that, um, that, that, uh, that then are used to determine, you know, have, have there been human rights violations or have there not been human rights violations? according to the law that um, that countries agree to. So, so there are parallels there with lots of different uh, international uh, treaty regimes. And, and that's something that, that we'll kind of keep digging further into and learning more about um, in order to kind of refine um, and refine this, this kind of proposal and re refine uh, the proposal for this discussion uh, going forward, because obviously there's still a, a way to go for the design of that. Uh, and it's important to, to dig deeper. But, but yes, there absolutely are, and and uh, you can, you know, I kind of mentioned a couple of things here, but but you can read uh, a little bit more, and hopefully there'll be more for you to read going forward, um, if if you'd like more detail on that. Excellent, thank you so much, Leith. So we have time for one one question. I'm going to take Sonia Stokes's question about what are some tangible or concrete steps toward obtaining U.S. engagement and expand on that a little bit, recognizing, you know, Tamron saying that by May 2024 we should have a final version of this pandemic treaty. So so what are we going to do? What are you going to do, I should say, between now and May 2024 uh, to ensure that this treaty reflects all of the um, uh, the hopes and dreams, the, the international human rights law principles that you want to incorporate into it, the accountability mechanisms and monitoring mechanisms that you're advocating for. 
Uh, what are some of the, ta the tangible or concrete steps toward achieving of that um, by May 2024, which perhaps would include obtaining uh, US engagement? Uh, and maybe you could share like the number one priority perhaps, or, or two or three priorities, um, and I'll give each one like 40 seconds to do so. So let me start with Leith and then head to Tamarin and then Tam go ahead, Leith. There is a surprising feature that, that has been going on recently within the negotiations, which is that the US um, administration has been a lot more engaged than it, than it kind of was expected to be. And so um, I think it's kind of, uh, at this point, it's more about maintaining that engagement than, than really um, obtaining it. And, um, you know, there will obviously kind of always be kind of kinks in, the, in any kind of political system, uh, but in addition to that, I would also like to emphasize that there are 196 WHO member states, and the WHO is, is a place where consensus decision making is a bit more of a feature than other places. And so it's um, it's really remarkable and, and, and good to see that, for example, you know, Brazil is taking a really active role in this, in, you know, speaking uh, the language that a lot of low and middle income countries want to see. Um, you know, it's, you know, the, the African bloc is also kind of uh, negotiating positions and, and and making kind of really strong coordinated statements you know it's it, it's about kind of much more than 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 one government and and you know a lot of the time as well within these intergovernmental negotiations countries push you know push each other on these positions and so it's important to, to really take all of that scene uh not just kind of focus on on individual actors um because it's all a, a dynamic system that, that interacts and so um you know i think that the uh, I've already kind of highlighted the the, the, the main priority that, that 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 we see. So I uh, would just emphasize its position within that system is that there is pressure from the outside in, uh, where you know uh, voices of academics of activists can say that it's great that countries have already said that they want legal obligations. Or um, managing pandemics going forward, um, so there's there's that push to uh, to continue that, but then also trying to kind of create that pressure on the inside by finding kind of key champions of those um, of, of of committing to those obligations and committing to an accountability mechanism that in, that, that promotes um, compliance with those um, obligations will be really important. So kind of really trying to kind of uh, capture the attention of, of of key players from within the system. To then push each other on that and 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 try to create that pressure from from within the negotiations as well. Excellent, thank you, Leith. Uh, Tamarin. Yes, uh, briefly, just because I know we're running out of time, but um, I agree with Leith, and I think just building on that, um, it is it is a positive thing that the U.S. is so engaged. You know, the pandemic hit the U.S. very hard, um, not just in terms of health systems and and number of deaths, but economically, and I think that that makes a difference. Um, and there is a stronghold on, on intellectual property rights and whatnot, but I do think there's an opportunity there to, um, to have more engagement. I think the risk is just, it seems like the pandemic treaty is going to happen. Um, I think the, the opportunity and risk is making sure that it actually has teeth and is not a treaty that ends up just being another piece of paper. Um, but I think, again, engagement is, is, is the way to go on that. Um, and I will also say, I think there are other, we have to think of it more holistically. So thinking of other places. So again, back to the TRIPS waiver, the the fact that the the trade agency in the U.S. is having meetings with civil society and talking about you know what what are what are the problems around intellectual property rights really engaging in that and and trying to to sort of shift some of the the, the perception and the and the concepts around um, some of those key issues because I think the issues are deep they're much more structural um, and if we can't change it now then um, we're going to have a problem down the road. Indeed, indeed, Tamarin. Thank you, Tim. Last word. <laughs> no pressure. Um, I think that the, 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 the overall category of thing that I would say is that we need to generate a political cost for governments for not ensuring a, a good pandemic treaty. And there isn't at this stage a very big threat of that. There's, you know, in between governments, there's a political interaction. What the, 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 the vaccine equity advocates did in COVID-19 very well is create a political cost, which even flowed through into the US 
um, and to many places in the world. With the US specifically, I think that that's also true. Um, and I think that we are looking to the US on these types of things to really, we hope that uh, people living in the US will take very seriously the importance of what happens in the US with this decision. So I was planning on saying this earlier, but I can end on it. Um, is a famous American uh, former slave, Frederick Douglass, um, who was a famous uh, uh, activist, I would say, in, in, in today's terms. And he said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to, and you have found the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. So the question really in the US and everywhere else is, is, is whether or not we are willing to accept post the pandemic with all of the losses that we've all experienced, the same thing again or not. Um, and, and if we don't act differently as a world, we won't have a different result in the future. What a wonderful way to end, Tim, with that quote uh, by Frederick Douglass. Thank you so much all for this incredible uh, discussion, um, traversing electricity and Wi-Fi issues, and then, of course, also engaging in a really difficult and challenging ongoing negotiation and discussion. Thank you for your succinct, clear, um, and encouraging comments and remarks on the Pandemic Treaty. And to all of those who participate in the Q&A, thank you very much for your excellent questions. Look forward to the next um, Heilbrunn Population and Family Health uh, Department seminar. Uh, keep checking our website for further events. Thank you all so much. Take good care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.